Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kostis Maglaras, I'm the Dean of Columbia Business School, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you in this very special panel on leadership and social justice. In the past year, leadership across the private and public sectors has been challenged in myriad ways uh, by the pandemic, uh, political polarization, major social justice issues. Uh, there have been difficult circumstances to push through, undeniable truths to acknowledge, uh, and in many ways, crucial conversations to be had, to be started, and more delayed measure to be taken by leaders, uh, all of us, to move the communities and to meet the mandates of creating a more inclusive, fair, and just society. Here at Columbia Business School, my primary role is really to prepare and save future leaders, and we hope uh, that uh, they will be able to practice courage, courageous form of leadership that activates a culture of equity, fairness, diversity, inclusivity, wherever they go, whatever organizations they join, they create and they lead. Uh, and it is it, with that vision in mind that we are representing and presenting today this distinguished panel of leaders that uh, straddle the boundary from corporate, judicial, healthcare arenas, uh, and uh, they will discuss essentially this very topic uh, uh, with us. And I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, welcoming uh, uh, three good friends of the school uh, to participate in that panel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share a few words about each of them, and then I'll leave it to them to guide us in the discussion. We introduce them first. Janet DeFiore is the Chief Judge of the Court of Appeals in the state of New York. Kevin Sowers is the President of John Hopkins Health System and the Executive Vice President of John Hopkins Medicine. And Sazi Visran is the Founder and, and Chair Mom of Happy Family Brands and the Founder and CEO of Health Nest. So I'm going to just say a couple of words for each of them and then uh, leave it to them to uh, talk to us about this uh, topic. So Chief Judge uh, Janet DeFiore has had really a very long and distinguished career as a prosecutor and a judge in New York State. She leads the state's incredibly complicated court system uh, that handles over 3 million new cases filings annually, delivered justice services to nearly 20 million New Yorkers. Uh, two years ago, she was a recipient of Columbia Business School's 2019 Deming Cup for Operational Excellence for her true commitment and to an evidence-based data-driven approach to improving court operations in this massive uh, uh, judicial system here in the state of New York. During COVID-19, uh, she oversaw the transformation of the entire uh, in-person court system uh, into a functioning virtual model that remained open throughout that period. Uh, in June of 2020, uh, this sort of uh, a little bit less than a year ago, she initiated an independent equal justice review of the state court system policies and practices as they related to issues of racial bias and fairness. And she has embraced these reviews findings and recommendations and has publicly expressed a commitment to policy to a policy of zero tolerance for racial bias and discrimination in our state's uh, New York, in our state's uh, court system here in New York. So I, I very much look forward to hearing more about Equal Justice with you and your commitment to eliminate racial and systemic bias in the judicial system. And Janet, I really thank you for joining us uh, today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Next, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, Kevin. Kevin Sowers, who oversees John Hopkins Health System. Uh, there are six hospitals and set strategies that advance their mission to essentially three-prong, deliver outstanding care, train the next generation of leaders, and advance research and discovery. Uh, prior to that, Kevin uh, served at the Duke University Health System for 32 years, the last date actually as president and CEO of the Duke University Hospital. Uh, last year, 2020, he is also a recipient of the 220 Demon Cup for Operational Excellence for his lifelong commitment, quality, operational excellence, equity, 
and social justice in the delivery of high quality healthcare for all. One hallmark of uh, Kevin's work during the pandemic is that he has driven the integration of social justice into the accessibility of healthcare, making concentrated efforts to ensure equity in both targeting and serving and supporting disadvantaged communities that were disproportionately affected during the pandemic. In addition to that, Kevin has had the most amazing journey uh, from uh, childhood in rural Ohio to an oncology nurse specialist and to the leader of a globally renowned healthcare provider, which is an inspiration in it by itself. So it is a pleasure to welcome you back. Kevin, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Costas, thank you so much for having me. Fantastic. So last and by no means least, uh, our very own Sazi Bisram. Uh, Sazi graduated from Columbia Business School in 2004 uh, and, uh, and went on to innovate and really change the landscape of the baby food business. Uh, so he launched a company called Happy Family Organics. Uh, she's an entrepreneur, she's a mother, she's committed to bettering the world through business that is socially and financially and environmentally enlightened. So she led that company that she started, Happy Family Brands, to become the number one organic baby food company in the U.S. market. Uh, that was driven on disruptive innovations that really eventually democratized organic food accessibilities for families. She's now the founder and CEO of Healthy Nest, which is her newest venture, which is dedicated to protecting uh, children's neurological health. Sassy is an Anabas advocate of social entrepreneurship. She's actively engaged as an investor, advisor to socially conscious companies, innovating for a brighter future, and serves on the board of an environmental working group. It's quite fitting, and I'm going to paraphrase something that President uh, Barack Obama said uh, in 2013 when she recognized Sanji that she's not only an outstanding businesswoman, but also a leader for all of us to emulate. So, Sazi, it is an honor that you're joining us as well uh, tonight. Uh, it's an honor to have you as an alumna and a friend of the school, and thank you for your uh, leadership within our school. So, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, uh, I'm going to step aside, and I'm going to let you get started. And, uh, Sazi, you can take it from here. All right. Well, um, thank you again, Kostis. And... I have to say, it's truly my pleasure and an honor as an alumna of the school to be having this conversation with you, um, Judge Janet DeFiori of, the, of New York State and Kevin Sowers, um, president of Johns Hopkins. And um, before we jump in, I wanna welcome everyone again. Um, this is a leadership on, a discussion, sorry, on, le on leadership and social justice. And what we're talking about today is the role and responsibility of organizations in fostering a just society. And as you know, it's also being offered as the Phillips pathway for inclusive leadership in the curriculum. And PPIL is, for those of you who don't know, a co-curricular program aimed at equipping all of the CBS students with these essential leadership skills necessary for harnessing and managing the power of diversity across the industries in which we hope and expect them to go on to lead and make impact in. So this is a really um, exciting time to have this discussion and I'm grateful to be a part of it, with the two of you. Um, the topics for, um, for clarity that we are gonna discuss today are three important ones that are close to our hearts. And those are addressing systemic inequity, communicate, communicating across identities, and of course, creating a truly inclusive environment. Um, to all the students who have joined us today, please refer to the chat window for, and for, the, uh, for the link to any guidelines from the organizers. And before we start, just to kind of give some ground rules, what we're gonna do um, format wise is I'm gonna discuss questions with Janet and Kevin that have come from our community. And then once we have managed to reach those, we answer those questions, we're gonna open it up uh, to those of you who've, who are joining us online. And I'm going to do our very best to keep us, um, keep us on time, which is not something that I am known for. So um, it is an opportunity for me to learn and grow today as well. Um, all right, so let's jump in. 
Janet and Kevin, it is such a pleasure to speak with you today on these topics that are truly close to our hearts. And it's so obvious as to people um, who are joining us that you both as leaders exemplify these ideals of diversity, equity, inclusion, and fairness. So my first question is one that kind of sets the ground rules. Um, as leaders, what do these values mean to you? You know, and what, what do you believe is your duty around fostering these views organizationally as you practice your leadership? So Janet, would you like to go first? Uh, sure, sure, my pleasure. And again, thank you for uh, organizing and, and hosting and moderating uh, our conversation today. So for me as chief judge of the state's high court where we develop the body of law by which all New Yorkers organize their personal and professional lives. And the other side, my job actually, and I think Kevin is in a similar position, I have a dual role, running the state's high court, developing the law, the substantive piece. And on the other side, chief judge of the state of New York, where I'm the head of the third branch of government, I run the justice system. I run the courts for the state of New York. So fairness and equity is at the foundation of everything we do. And certainly diversity and inclusion has to be a part of that. And for us in, in our work in the justice business, we must earn and maintain uh, the public's trust and confidence in what we're doing and trust and confidence that we are all about fairness. We are about equity. We are about inclusiveness. So for us, it is a top priority. And as we go through the conversation uh, today, I hope that I can explain in a deeper and broader way what that means for individual judges and how they participate in, in uh, achieving social justice on behalf of the people we serve, and also for me as the leader of the judicial branch of government. Well, um, thank you, Janet. That's very inspirational. And um, I, too, am looking forward to learning from you about how it all works, because it's quite fascinating for someone on the outside mm -hmm. uh, to learn. And I'm sure everyone's tuned in to hear so much from you. Um, moving to Kevin. Kevin, what do these values mean to you? Um, Fairness, equity, equal justice. So, Shazi, I, it was one of those questions that I paused and thought about the difference between <laughs> perceptions and perspective. Um, and the perception is, as you listen to me today and you look at the screen, you see a white male. And so, uh, on the surface, you may think of me as being representative of uh, structural and systemic racism and how it evolved in our country. And while I know that not, that I am a white male, uh, this is where I get into perceptions versus perspective. The perspective is I grew up in poverty in rural Ohio. And so when I start thinking about health equity issues, I'm reminded of not having indoor plumbing until I was seven years of age. I'm reminded of the issues we had to getting access to health care. I'm reminded of when I'm in conversations with people who say if people would just go to school and get a job. Well, uh, culturally, it's not that easy. Um, I've tried that with my nieces and nephews and have failed miserably. So I come with a different perspective. Secondly, I am openly gay. Um, and because of that, um, when I dealt with my sexuality, it was still a diagnosis in the DSMV. I was going to a church that told me that I should hate myself. And so when you start thinking about equal uh, justice and fairness and diversity, I have two different perspectives. The third perspective I have is my husband to be after eight years is an African-American male. And um, I have experienced both conscious and unconscious bias in very new, unique ways where I've seen microaggressions, where we may be out to dinner and the person who brings the bill always sits it in front of me. And I use that as a teaching moment to put the bill in front of him and say, no, I was expecting him to pay. When we go into a department store, someone will approach me first versus him. And actually he's the shopper in the family, not me. So uh, I come, I, the reason I describe that is I think it's important that we understand the difference between perceptions 
and perspectives because people may come to this conversation with a perspective that on the surface you may not completely understand. And as a leader, I think it's important for people to understand my perspective and what drives my perspective, even though I am on the surface and seen as a white male. Um, I bring a lot of, of richness to the conversation that others may not have. Well, I um, certainly, if the last few years or decades or centuries have taught us anything as we can't judge a book by their cover. And um, I very much appreciate you sharing your story. I very much relate. I, um, I grew up in a motel room in Alabama and my father was a truck driver in Tanzania and they only ever had dirt floors under their feet. And my mother was actually a doctor in Pakistan, but when she came uh, to Toronto, which is where I was born, uh, she was a nurse and, um, and they, and literally she, you know, was paid a couple of dollars a day, um, and not respected as, you know, who she really was. And I, I've kind of grown up in this really interesting, uh, world where now I live in Connecticut with, um, my husband is, he is kind of like my arm candy. Um, he's, a <laughs> Uh, he was a former male fashion model. I'm not kidding. And so he's literally like my arm candy and I'm the one who's always working. He's, he has a very happy life at this point. And it is funny. The bill always comes to him, but, and, um, and, and even still, I mean, there are just so many opportunities in life to showcase the diversity of all of our experiences and to remind people that what what they might think is not actually what's there. And I think there's always a, a, a meaningful way to, to bring diversity to the table in a way that's enlightening and reminds people that, wow, we, we live in a unique and um, diverse world where diversity is actually exceptionally wonderful. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, it, I, I, I'd love to talk more about how, you know, I know there are these microaggressions and there are these micro moments where we can share things and it breaks down walls and we become more vulnerable. But when, when we're talking about operationally and, you know, organizationally, um, how do you both see, you know, this sort of idea of creating systemic diversity? How do we, how do we create a culture that's sustainable within our organizations to ensure that that diversity is there. Um, Janet, would you like to start? Oh, sh sure, sure, I would love to. So, so, so for me, everything comes back, of course, to my leadership. I'll, I'll talk about myself and, and, and the court system and being a hands-on leader. And the most important thing I think I have contributed is I have worked very hard to create an environment where honest, open dialogue is not only encouraged, but it's demanded. And it takes a while to get to that point because most people uh, come at that with a sort of gotcha. At a, is this a gotcha exercise? It's not a gotcha. It's about authenticity. It's about honesty. When we talk about meaningful inclusion and all, all that all that we need to do to achieve meaningful inclusion, we have to have some honest conversations about. And in my organization, so it's a very large organization, we have 3,000 judges, we have 15,000 employees, um, 12 unions who represent the employees and have different interests and pulls. And initially, it was very hard to communicate to people. This is, we are going to be about authenticity and honesty here. And we are going to talk about how we diversify ourselves. We have some built-in limitations. Our judges, who are the leaders in our organization, are either elected by the popular vote or they're appointed by the governor of the state of New York to a fixed term. So... I get who I get, <laughs> and then it's my job to make sure 
that we are creating um, uh, an environment within the context of what comes to us, which is a little tricky, which is a little tricky because a, a lot of what we do is preordained in terms of the personnel that we have. I do, I do have that question for you because for me as CEO, I can sort of hire and fire as I see fit. And mm -hmm. you, I mean, are like the CEO of CEOs. I mean, it's the, the this ultimate organization, yet that is a limitation that you, you live with. How do you, um, and you're clearly so principled in your ideals, but how how do you ensure diversity with that limitation? I mean, if you can't if if you can't hire and fire those people, how do you ensure it? So so here's how I try to I operate on the assumption that the majority of people come at their work with the best of intentions. Um, I also have in place very nicely worded, eloquently worded policies about uh, discrimination and, and bias and, and zero tolerance. But, and, and I believe in both of them. I believe that people come at, come at uh, their work uh, to, in a um, mode to do the right thing and that our policies are good policies. But the best intentions of people and the, the neatly written policies won't matter for much unless we're working every single day to achieve the ideal for us. And for me, <laughs> that's about engaging all of our leaders on a daily basis and making sure we have a very strong management structure in place, communicating both up and down, uh, leading by example, and making certain that when I have the opportunity to make appointments to important leadership positions, that I make certain that they are reflective of the people that we serve and, and our the workforce, and uh, to just to stay focused on the issues and keep our people focused on the issues. Um, it's not. It, it, it's hard to achieve that ideal because, as we, in such a big organization, because there's so many people and there's so much to do. But it, I have found that when you create a management environment that is very hands-on and open, and we have regular meetings. I have run since for over a year now a statewide meeting with dozens of people every single day. At one o'clock, we convene for our meeting and we go through our regular agenda to make sure everyone is staying on task and reminding people about what our obligation is, what our mission is, what the how important our litigants' perception of not only the product that we produce, which is a decision in each case, but the way in which we go about it and the people who deliver our justice services to them. I mean, I, I think it's an it, it, incredible testament to your leadership skills to be able to do that and that and, and create that environment. Um, it, it's, it's quite amazing. I mean, I, I feel, you know, in business, our product is our product, and the consumer is the one who has the mandate for um, for what they want. And it's my responsibility to help create this product or service in a way that makes them feel good. Um, and so my mandate ends up being driven quite economically. And luckily, in today's world, you know there is an alignment of the consumer demand and social ethics that kind of allow me to do what I do in a way that makes me feel good. Um, and I, you know, it's hats off to you. Um, I, I, I'd love to hear also Kevin's point of view on this as basically the CEO in charge of providing health to every single person um, who is looking for, for, for support. How do, you, um, how do you bring forth that type of process to ensure that all of your ideals are being implemented organizationally? So first of all, I'd say, Shazi, um, you have to look at the core values you're gonna have as an organization. And um, diversity and inclusion is one of our core values. And it's, it, your, your values should not just be something hanging on a wall um, in someone's office. You have to think through how do you live those and how do you 
uh, encourage behaviors in your organization that align with those values. I'll give you a great for instance. I was interviewing a very talented African-American male for a position today. Um, and I said, tell me a story about in your current role, um, how um, your organization uh, drives uh, uh, strategies or initiatives around diversity and inclusion. Um, and he said, well, my organization has not prioritized diversity and inclusion. And I live in a state that doesn't um, prioritize diversity and inclusion. And I, he said, that's why I want to leave. Um, so you've got to have that as a part of your core value system um, because people who are from diverse backgrounds are going to look not just as it in words, but how are you living it? Secondly, um, how you provide feedback to your workforce. And it's not just about outcomes because I've seen a lot of people who can achieve the outcome but they leave a lot of people wounded along the roadside in getting there. Um, and it's often people of diff from different backgrounds. Um, and so clearly, how do you begin to not just evaluate the outcomes, but evaluate the behaviors that tie back to the core values of the organization so that you can give people feedback on are they aligned with the behaviors of the, uh, that align with the core values? I would also say you have to do purposeful hiring um, and when I was at Duke, uh, one of the challenges I faced is whenever we went out to market for senior leadership positions, it was not uncommon to have the recruiter come back and I would ask for a diverse minority pool. And they would say, this was in my early years at Duke, they would say, well, that kind of person doesn't exist. So what I did was I took our fellowship program and turned it into a program where I was purposely going to recruit women and I was purposely going to recruit people of color. And um, I said, I'm, I, I can either be a part of the problem or I can be a solution because if I didn't do anything, I was never gonna change the makeup. And so over a 14 year period of, of driving that uh, uh, fellowship program, I raised a lot of people of color who are now in leadership roles in healthcare and a lot of women in, in, in healthcare positions. And so you have to be purposeful in your strategies that align with the core value of diversity and inclusion. The other thing I would say uh, just in closing um, around this is that's one part of, of making sure that your provider base represents and your leadership base represents the community you um, are representing and serving. But I would also say that as it comes to health equity, part of my responsibility is to making sure that I understand the data that is really driving health equity issues. And I'll give you a great example. When I was at Duke, I looked to the five counties to the north of the Raleigh-Durham area, and it was in our service and catchment area. And if you were an African-American male living in those five counties, you were more likely, if you had a diagnosis of diabetes, to get an amputation than anywhere else in the state of North Carolina. And when we began to do our work, around what was driving that, it was actually foot care and it was actually access to diabetic shoes. And so we began to put a nurse out in the field in those five counties that would do diabetic foot checks, would buy shoes, diabetic shoes. And over a period of three years uh, in collaboration with our vascular surgeons, we were able to decrease the number of African-American men who were getting amputations. Um, and improve their quality of life and uh, not having them live with disabilities related to um, amputation. So you, you really have to think broader about your community and understanding the data that drives some of the healthcare disparities and healthcare equities um, that are, are in our environment. And so um, that's really how I think about it in the healthcare setting. There's the workforce and the leadership piece but then I have to think about the patients we serve and how do we develop a creative models to deal with some of the healthcare equity issues that we're presented with in today's world. I mean, that's, um, it's also a testament to how much you care when you ask the right questions and listen and then look at the data for meaningful human answers. And that is, uh, um, it's quite an outcome. Um, Maybe just by running a query, there's so much, so much we can learn and do when we take a minute and think about why and listen. Um, 
Janet, do you have anything to add um, to this to this line, or um, or shall I move? I want to um, make sure that I have a chance. Well, I, I I find it fascinating, Kevin, um, that you um, drill down so deeply as a leader of a, a big organization, whether it's Duke or uh, Johns Hopkins, and I think that is the model of modern leadership that people are very um, uh, granular, that uh, not to the extent of debilitating your, your other responsibilities, but I, I feel that um, your stories are reflective of a very successful model. And um, it's one that I have tried to implement in the courts by staying very close to the trial level courts where, where we have literally millions of people coming through our buildings throughout New York State every year. And um, I like to be involved in just on that level to, and I just kind of like to roam around and, and, and figure out what's happening in each of our, our different buildings throughout the state. Well, I think we have an obligation in healthcare because I can tell you by zip code in the Baltimore city um, whether or not you're going to die 10 to 15 years earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at it in those communities that are, are likely not to have a higher mortality rate and die earlier, um, structural and systemic racism led to Section 8 housing, um, led to access, lack of access to food, the social determinants that begin to drive uh, some of what we see in health outcomes. And so as a senior leader, I feel obligated that we partner with those communities and understand what we can to do to change health outcomes. Uh, it's a part of our core mission in, in delivering on the promise of medicine. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm gonna switch gears. Are we, this, um, difficult, important, and obviously we, we we have to talk about this. Um, so we all know last Memorial Day weekend, Americans witnessed a brutal killing of George Floyd in, in Minnesota. Um, it galvanized the Black Lives Matter movement. And in a sense, it introduced the movement to many people for the first time. Um, and as we are here speaking today, uh, the trial of former Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin is underway in Minneapolis. Um, and highlighting yet again the horror of that incident, not to relive it for us, but there are strong feelings that have been elicited from the people around justice, equity, and the fairness of law enforcement as a result. And this tragedy was such a wake-up call uh, to, you know, the civic population as well as to business leaders who basically said, we have to do something in moving the work forward towards eliminating systemic racial bias in our organizations, bringing more authentic focus on the values of diversity, equity, inclusion in our organizations, um, and not just our private organizations, but public, private, um, educational, nonprofit. And this question, of course, goes straight to you, Janet, as chief judge of one of the most complex states in the United States of America. Can you tell us um, how the New York State courts responded to this national turning point sure. on the issue of systemic bias and racial injustice? Mm -hmm. And remember, for many years, I was a prosecutor. I served as the elected district attorney in a very large county uh, in New York State for 10 years. Uh, so, um, I am intimately familiar with, with the issues around uh, excessive use of force, police misconduct, police involved shootings. But you know, when Mr. Floyd was killed just in, in front of our eyes, I, when I think about that, it was it, that event s sparked an explosion and it was almost like this pent up anger and frustration and confusion just sort of exploded on the scene, right? And across every demographic, uh, uh, gender, age, race, socioeconomic position in life, everyone felt that for whatever the reason, whatever caused that. 
And I remember thinking to myself, well, of course, as a leader of the justice system, I was concerned about the impact that would have on us. But I remember thinking to myself, this is a moment in time. This is going to be a turning point. And my first instinct was to pen a statement, join my colleagues all across America, chief judges, public officials, elected officials. And I did that. And of course, it was a nicely, neatly worded again statement. Sat on my desk for three days and I couldn't pull the trigger, and I didn't know why, on releasing the statement. And it was, there was something that just didn't feel right about doing that. It's a little hollow, quite frankly, <laughs> to do that. And just at about that time, we had a horrific incident with one of our own employees who posted a terrible, terrible racist Facebook post. And that came to my attention. And about a day later, I received a very poignant email from one of our own employees. And it got me to thinking that we had deep trouble in our own organization. And so I decided <laughs> to rip off the Band-Aid and to figure out how we can do a complete unplugged, uncensured review of all of our practices, our protocols, our hiring practices, our disciplinary practices within the New York State court system. And I tapped uh, uh, Jay Johnson, who I'm sure um, you all are familiar with, a national figure served in the Obama administration as Secretary of Homeland Security, magnificently successful lawyer and public servant. And I called him and I told him what I wanted to do. I said, I think I have trouble here, deep trouble here, um, not the usual kind of fringe trouble. And I said, I uh, want to do a, a no holds barred review. I will give you complete access to everything that is not by law confidential within the court system and you can go in any direction you want. And he thought about it for about a minute and he agreed to do it. And he conducted a four month investigation into our protocols and practices in the New York state court system. And he um, uh, did a magnificent report to us. He made some very strong and practical and pragmatic recommendations to us, and we've accepted every single one of them, and we're off on to our, um, our uh, implementation plan. And what that did, I believe, is confirm in people's minds what I hoped that they were thinking about my leadership in terms of authentic and honest and unafraid to examine what we're doing. If we're doing something wrong under my leadership, it's not because I'm not well-intentioned to do what's right, that my leadership team isn't well-intentioned to do what's right. Sometimes there are, are nuances or subtleties or things that get away from our folks don't understand them. Uh, Kevin before was talking about perceptions and implicit bias, biases, right? And, and, and I, I believe that we have, made, we have come to a turning point in the New York State court system. And I'm, I'm not sure if it's working yet, but we are certainly on our way to um, putting in place practices, I think, that elevate the level of confidence from our own employees. I'm talking about now our internal work. I'm not talking about externally how we service our litigants and, and our court users. And that's a conversation I'm sure we'll get into and, and the importance of doing that with fairness and equity and equality. I'm, I'm curious, um, Janet, uh, do you believe the intention with which you set out to say, we are an open book, audit us, show us what's not working, show us what's working so we can improve. Do you believe that in the world of corporate leadership where there's not necessarily a mandate? Um, 
there's not necessarily a mandate for me to lead my organization with diversity or inclusivity or any of these ideals of uh, giving back and creating abundance and supporting the health and wellness of everyone in a de democratic fashion. It's not necessarily required of me. Do you believe that corporate leaders um, should approach their organizations similarly? So I do, I do. And, and I, I, I think that particularly leaders in the business community and in the corporate world do, do have a, a social responsibility um, to, uh, to pay it forward, to make sure. Also, before I get to that, you have employees. Your employees want to feel invested in you, want to feel confident in your good intentions, in your hard work, in your commitment to fairness and equality. As I said before, I have 15,000 people who work under my leadership, 3,000 judges. I want them to know I care about you. I care about running an organization that recognizes everyone's skills, that, that levels the playing field for every one of our court family, giving them the opportunity to, to rise up in our organization. And that's why getting back to the point before, it's important what you do. And, and every time that we have an opportunity to uh, appoint someone to a high level leadership position, these are the things that need to be in the forefront of our mind about to Kevin's point before purposeful, uh, I call them um, promotions. And for us in the New York state courts, since I've been there over the last five years, we have had the most diverse leadership team in the history of the New York state courts. And I'm very, very proud of that. And we've done that in many different ways. We've mentored people into those positions. We've found people who were already at the stage where they were ready to take the next lift up. And it's enormously, it not only is it enormously rewarding to me and it inspires me and energizes me to continue to do this work, but it's very important for those 15,000 employees who, who watch what's going on in their organization and to our judges as well and leading by example. Thank, thank you for that. I, um, you know, from a business standpoint, uh, years ago when there was a lot of anti-immigration immigrant sentiment being roiled um, at Happy Family, we, what we decided and what I felt was important was number one, to codify the why and the who we are and why we do what we do and then come together as a management team and agree on the ideals that we want to set out into the world and, it, and internally within our own families and our own teams. And so we wrote what we called the Happy Manifesto and we all signed it. And I felt that by codifying it, it put a line in the sand, this is who we are and this is who we wanna become and we're not perfect, at, nor is anyone, but we wanna to strive towards perfection. And then after George Floyd, um, my new startup Healthy Nest is actually on a street that was absolutely ravaged the next day um, in Soho and my team was quite confounded and we were all so disillusioned and um, I realized it was time to do it again. So we wrote the healthy manifesto um, and we all signed it and we all decided what's important to us and all the ideals that we hope to instill in the future. And, um, and, and we hold ourselves accountable to go back um, and actually ensure that we're making progress on the goals that we've set for ourselves. It's interesting uh, you say that because uh, what the, the number one recommendation, the first recommendation from Secretary Johnson's report was write a happy manifesto. It has to come from the, but it had to come from the leader first. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then before I move on to Kevin, uh, because it's a bit of a segue, but when that happened, my husband and I were speaking last night in prep for this. And I've been so excited and nervous, honestly, to be with you both, um, mm -hmm. especially on these topics. We were talking about, um, you know, what it meant to us. And we have a son with autism who visibly, I mean, in fact, he looks like a movie star. If you see our son, um, he's so beautiful. And he has a serious neurological disorder uh, that impairs his ability to do a number of things um, and understand, And you know, in, in many cases, um, 
there there are chances where my son can be restrained um, depending on what's going on in the environment. And if those aren't familiar with his condition, um, it you know it could it could very much go sideways. And um, we we certainly take this to heart as we think about inclusivity. And again, back to Kevin, I want to turn this back to you. It's it's all about perception. And I think it's you know this drive to be a better human that we see in the leaders that we're celebrating today. It's not just about um, it's not just about being a tough leader and getting it done. There's a reason why. And um, Kevin, I, I'd like to get to your um, thinking, you know, this flashpoint that happened, how, how did it affect the healthcare industry? Um, and, you know, in, in terms of the context of historical inequities that continue to impact, you know, these social determinants um, of health, you know, what are your feelings in terms of the duty of healthcare leaders to take a, a stand against this type of systemic injustice? Well, Shazi, I, I appreciate what you said about you talking uh, to your husband last night, because um, it was a flashpoint for me on a personal and professional level. On a personal level, I thought that could be my husband. Um, because what most people don't realize is when you're in an interracial relationship like this, you have to have conversations about where he can drive and can't drive at night, um, when he can wear a hoodie and when he can't wear a hoodie. Um, what if he gets stopped? Um, what should he do and how should he act? And so on a personal level, when I watched that, I, I, I had a personal reaction. And of course, in, in the healthcare industry, it, it, the geopolitical stage that we have watched transform, um, we have seen several things happen. We have seen patients refuse people of color who are our providers, refuse to allow them to take care of them because of the color of their skin. We have seen providers mistreat patients uh, and that's not consistent, but you know, the new study just came out uh, and I don't know if you've had time to, Robert Wood Johnson and the Urban Institute just released a study where they did an analysis of data back from September of 2020. And it showed that 10.6% of the respondents to a self-reported survey um, identified discrimination and racism in, in their healthcare. And when you looked at the subset of data, it really showed that it was more likely to be women and people who were living in poverty uh, in underserved communities. So, you know, it, it, it reinforces that there is this element there of uh, access to providers. And when they get in to see the provider, what does that look like? Um, we have had providers who are physician providers that have gone to other providers without them knowing they were providers and can tell you stories of being treated differently um, because they didn't realize they were a physician or a nurse and yet they, they themselves witnessed it. So it does happen. Um, and then also employee to employee. So this was a flashpoint in all industries. This was not unique to the judicial system and, and, and so, or, or healthcare. And so, you know, on the day it happened, um, immediately people started calling me and saying, we have to do something today. And much like Janet, um, I said, uh, no, we, 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 what we're going to do today is we're going to listen. Um, because this is a, an onion. And this is an onion that's been growing with layers for many years. And so it was a, an important time for me as an organizational leader to teach our leaders, and, and listen to what I'm saying, to teach them how to talk about race. Exactly. Because what I learned was number one, not everybody is comfortable talking about race. And if the leader demonstrates the ability and even the ability to make mistakes in having the conversation and apologize when they make a mistake, you start to create a more transparent and meaningful community where people feel comfortable sharing what it's like to be different and how they've been treated and what they've seen. Um, so across our organization, we did listening sessions. Um, uh, having participated in, in some, it was it was amazing to hear the stories that people brought up and watch people break into tears because of their own personal stories of what had happened. 
So there were I a lot- I feel like it right now. I yeah. mean- I mean, there was, there was a lot of unhealed wounds that this opened up, but before we took action, and I'll never forget being on a, a phone call, and by the way, they, they, everyone on the Zoom call was well-meaning, and I was, I was looking at my Brady Bunch screen, um, uh, and everybody was said, we, we, Kevin, we've got to do something, we've got to do something, and I think we should do this, and I, think, and I had to say to people, stop, L look at what's on the screen. It was all white people. This is another example of structural and systemic racism. We think we know what's best for what we might do to help support people of color, but we're not having the dialogue with the people of color. So how do you begin to, as a leader, confront those moments where people's intentions might be good, but they're not seeing how they're, they're laying out a structural and systemic process that still doesn't include people who are diverse and, 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 and from diverse backgrounds. So number one, we listened. Um, number two, um, I would tell you that um, we really uh, uh, had to really think through what, how we were gonna take the feedback from that and inform our strategic plan on diversity and inclusion. And that's what we've done. We've taken all the feedback and really built it into a five-year plan with our diversity and inclusion officer of how we're going to move the culture in a different direction and begin to address the stories we heard, the issues that we heard as we move forward. So it's a, it's a, a very important part of our, our organizational fabric at this point in time. So, so Shazi, if I, I, I can. So, so I, I think that, that what Kevin is saying, just said, is the most important thing. Conversations about race and inclusion are very difficult conversations to have. And they're not worth anything if people aren't going to come to the table and be honest about their perceptions, about their feelings, about their experiences. So it's up to Kevin, it's up to me, it's up to you to create that environment where people know, no matter what you look like, I'm a white woman with blonde hair. No matter what you look like, you have to show people, not tell people with your words or your posts, show people what you're about and what your commitment is to your organization. And that goes back also to your question about corporate responsibility. Kevin sounds like he's experiencing this, experienced the same things that we've experienced in the healthcare system and the justice system. Has to be in a, in a corporate setting as well, right? Well, um, I mean, we have to move on to the pandemic because it's so obviously the next mm -hmm. big thing. But I have mm -hmm. to say, you know, my whole life's work now, given the gift of my son and his autism, is to focus on um, developmental health. And the, one of the things that I've really learned over the last many years is that it is our environment, not just our genetics, that shape us. And it is the interactions we have in our environment, the safety we feel in our environment, the enrichment that we might get in our environment or the lack thereof that allow us to become who we are. And I specifically try to focus that on uh, this really special time when you are you know, pregnant and have a baby, um, when the brain is development, but, but developing, but actually in the reality of our human existence, this is always happening. You know, We have to create environments where we feel safe, where we can express ourselves introduce novelty, and then learn. It's basically how neural connections are made. Um, and so I, I find it you know, all very interrelated. And I think the one thing driving it, as Janet, you've said, and Kevin, you've shown, is that it's the, it's the intention of the leader to do it in a way that is principled and meaningful um, and will take action um, that can make the difference. And I, you know, I, I, we have to talk about the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. It's really interesting, Kevin, that you, you know, this polarizing um, thing happened in, on Memorial Day, but was happening during, amidst this insanely, insane global pandemic that we've all been living in. Um, it, and, you know, we've all been dealing with it in our own ways. I certainly have. Um, but, you know, 
the pandemic in a way I feel like has exposed so many of these longstanding inequities um, and injustices that, you know, that, that have now sort of bubbled up um, to this global population. And Kevin, I'd like to talk to you specifically or hear from you specifically on how the pandemic um, has exposed these cracks even more. Um, or especially around the vulnerable communities. And you've touched on it a bit, but I know that you have a, a really interesting background um, with the AIDS epidemic before this pandemic and many other issues in healthcare. So what could you share, enlighten us, enlighten us a bit um, on, on the pandemic and how that's so also- I'll start, first of all, of my experience in the HIV epidemic that we, we witnessed uh, many years ago. Um, and by the way, it wasn't even called HIV at that point in time, or AIDS, it was called GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency syndrome. Oh. Um, and uh, so I remember clearly, I was a bedside nurse. We didn't know about the virus. Policies were changing every day. There was no treatment. Um, this starts to sound familiar. So when this pandemic hit our country, um, when, when I saw it in China, I knew it was going to come here. So we began planning months ahead because of my experience with HIV and knowing what we would need to prepare for. Uh, but what was interesting was a lot of the people that I now work with weren't alive when HIV hit. So they, they, they were maybe alive as small children, but um, they don't remember what took place. So this was all new to many people um, of, of how you respond and how you lead through a pandemic. Um, I, I also realized that in the midst of a pandemic, Hopkins is a, a great, incredible health system and incredible enterprise as it relates to research and education and clinical care. But I also realized this was not something we were gonna be able to respond to by ourselves. So it was gonna take a public-private relationship. And so I reached out to my colleague at University of Maryland, uh, uh, Dr. Mohan Santa, and I also, reached out to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Bobby Neal, um, and the governor's office, and really offered up a partnership where we could begin to do things collectively together in our, our community. So the first thing we did, we set up a field hospital um, in our convention center, where we would begin to provide testing services, and also provide uh, low-level acute care services if our hospitals became overwhelmed. Um, we also, uh, as we've evolved that field hospital, we now provide monoclonal antibody infusions there. If people cannot get to the site, uh, can't afford to get to the site with transportation, we actually pay for their car service to be taken back and forth for testing, uh, infusions, and or now vaccines, because we do about uh, 1,000 to 1,500 vaccines a day in that at that site now. Wow. So we came together as a a community to serve our community in those ways. I also partnered uh, in DC um, with Dr. Nesbitt, uh, who is uh, over DC Health. I reached out to her because I was very concerned about uh, people living in senior housing units in the district um, and offered uh, Johns Hopkins Medicine to come in and vaccinate um, all of the senior residents living in senior housing. You know, I've now done, personally as a nurse, I've done, uh, uh, about six of the sites in DC now. And it's very interesting to go because you are seeing people who have lost limbs related to their diabetes, who are in electric wheelchairs, who would never get to a mass vaccination site, who would never get to a pharmacy or, and so bringing it to them um, and seeing the joy in their faces because they had really not interacted with people for a year, um, and, and being in their rec room or wherever we could do it safely um, made me rethink about what we might have to do for vulnerable populations and delivery of healthcare services in the future. And really, do they need to come to us or are there things we could do in the places where they live that would be more meaningful to driving and improving their health outcomes? So we have now done close to uh, 20 sites in the district we are also now doing that. We depart, uh, partnered with uh, uh, the Housing Authority, both in DC and Baltimore City and the Health Department here in Baltimore. And we're now doing vulnerable populations here in Baltimore City and reaching out. 
As we started doing that in Baltimore, what we also realized early on uh, when we began testing events was that our community around our hospital was really struggling with access to food. Uh, and it was really because of the economic impact uh, that was, because uh, many of these people had several jobs um, and lost one of their jobs. And even with our own workforce, we watched that happen for some of our lower level employees. And so uh, to date, we've now delivered, we uh, partnered with a food distributor. We've now delivered over 6.2 million meals to families in East Baltimore that could not have food during this difficult time. We also looked at hotspots. Um, there was a hotspot in uh, zip code 21224, which is near one of our hospitals uh, called Bayview uh, in, in East Baltimore. And uh, it is a uh, Latinx population. The positivity rate there was 30%. When mm -hmm. the rest of the state was seeing about a, a nine to 10% positivity rate. So we, went, we partnered with the Catholic Church um, and we at the Catholic Church parking lot set up a, a testing event and had the Catholic Church there um, and the priest there uh, as a part of our intervention uh, because a lot of people were afraid to come and be tested. And if they were sick, they were afraid to go to the hospital because they were afraid of ICE coming to get them if they were not um, uh, in this country uh, legally. And so what we did for them is we opened up the Lord Baltimore Hotel, um, because if you know anything about the, the cultural elements of the Latinx populations, it's not uncommon for multiple generations to live in one household. So we became concerned about their ability to quarantine and quarantine safely. So we opened the Baltimore Hotel uh, for a quarantining site for vulnerable populations so that we could begin to stop the spread uh, uh, at such a high rate in that community. And we were very successful with the help of the local priest and a, a, a religious organization here in the city called BUILD. So once again, it, I'm, I'm talking about the partnership that leaders have to create to reach vulnerable populations also. Well, and the creativity and the adaptability, I mean, to quickly adapt to this very fast changing scenario has been, um, I mean, what you've just described is, you know, you're an incredible marketer and you're a very, you have these insights and you bring the right people together and then you act. And, um, I, you know, to, to, to turn to how, how did you do it, Shannon? Because Kevin is dealing with this global health pandemic. You still have justice to serve. How did you transform the, the, the courts to go completely virtual like that? So when the pandemic struck, you know, people in New York, New York City particularly, where we have the lion's share of our cases, were on the verge of panic. And, you know, everyone was confused. No one wanted to, to come to work. We, we're in the justice business. It's an in-person business. We have thousands of emergency and essential applications that are heard every day. People are arrested. They need to be brought before a judge and arraigned and have bail set or be released from custody. The child welfare system has been exploding in New York City. We have children who are living in dangerous situations and we do, we do these emergency removals. My message clearly, I, I remember that first meeting in the beginning of March, you know, eight o'clock at night in a dark building in New York City and I'm talking to our folks, there's like 30 of us in the room and they all have their eyes wide. And my message was, I know everyone wants to go home. We are not closing the courts. We cannot close the courts. The courts have to be open. People have to know government is working, that the rule of law is in place. We didn't know if the panic would lead to unrest. <laughs> so, so what we did was our brilliant technology people helped us to transform an in-person system into a virtual court system literally overnight throughout the state. And by April, we had virtual courts up and running in all 62 counties across the state. Now that said, it's a magnificent achievement. It's worked nicely over the past year, but there is a digital divide in our country. And the poorest people, people in communities of color, 
don't have the same access as I do <laughs> to uh, broadband, to computers, to smartphones, the way we're connecting up uh, to courtrooms, virtual courtrooms. And that is a real problem. And it's interesting. You know, we talk about in, in New York State that there are two systems of justice. There's a system of justice for people of means. And now those people usually go to the Supreme Court where everyone has a lawyer, everyone gets to have their cases fully litigated. And then there are what I call the people's courts, the family court, the housing court, where poor people and, pe and, and people of color come to resolve the most intimate, foundational and fundamental issues affecting their lives and their families. And it's hard for people to access those courts. And we have been struck, we've been struggling in New York State. I have been advocating for a, 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 a constitutional amendment uh, because our court system is, uh, uh, the structure is set out in the constitution. And I want to take our court system, which has 11 layers of different trial courts with the Supreme Court, where people get their cases resolved at the top of that heap, and the rest of the court sort of being the stepchildren of the court system. And that's all baked into the Constitution. And I've been advocating to wipe out those differences, make one trial court, and have all of our judges and resources flowing in between all the different trial levels and be able to service uh, the cases where we where we need more attention uh, uh, applied to those cases. But it's been a very difficult and heavy political lift for a lot of reasons that we'll go into at a different time. But it, it, this points out getting back to part of our conversation before, you can be very well intentioned and you could have great practices and protocols in place. And the virtual court system has been a godsend for essential and emergency matters are being heard. Supreme Court matters where lawyers log on and, and can conference cases where the Supreme Court justice are being heard. Um, but we, we really are uh, concerned and worried and focused on making certain that we are putting in place initiatives and practices that allow people to access the virtual courts. And Kevin was saying that he, he partnered with the, um, the Catholic Church on one of his initiatives. I have always, over the course of my career in, in the court system, look to partner with our faith communities as well. And m my feeling and my focus has always been that we focus on the people who are least able to access, right? And because access is to justice is what we are all about. If you talk about social uh, um, uh, justice and equity and people who are in trouble, who do they turn to? Many, they're pastors, they're priests, they're rabbis. So we partnered with uh, the faith community and we're doing these pilot programs where the churches are opening up their centers and supplying um, the uh, digital uh, uh, equipment that people need to access courts. And we're talking about victims of domestic violence who need to see a judge to get a temporary order of protection or permanent order of protection. We're talking about women who, who are uh, abused and have children in their homes. We're talking about uh, parents who have had their children removed from them or are trying to get their kids back. So um, again, coming full circle about partnership, about commitment, about identifying issue and action, concrete action, to put in place practices and protocols and procedures that serve everyone in our communities. Um, I wanna pick up, Shazi, on something that Janet said that, that really hit us also, and that is um, we are designing most of our word, world now around uh, an IT platform. And my concern is, is we're going to leave a certain part of our population behind because even if I look at how people were to sign up for vaccination, you were to go online. Well, there's entire parts of our community that do not have Wi-Fi access, who do not have an iPad or an iPhone. They may have a burner phone. 
Uh, but so we had to go out and set up community access points where people could come and register for their vaccine. But I am concerned as I watch all industries that we're building this IT world that not everybody's going to be able to be a part of um, and will be left behind. And there, there are significant social and health ramifications of that um, as we move forward. And we are a people to people business, both of us, the healthcare industry, the justice system certainly is a people to people uh, yep. industry. And my fear is that with these virtual platforms, justice becomes a very, very disconnected exercise then. You, you, can't, you, you, you can't provide justice services remotely. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Uh, well, there's certainly a lot of things we can't do remotely um, that we need to find solutions for when there's no mm -hmm. alternative. And I, mm -hmm. um, I do mm -hmm. see, you know, this conversation shines a light on so many of the complex challenges that so many sectors have to face, but both of you are just, I'm kind of in awe um, and you're both my heroes. Um, and that leads me to another question that, that I know our audience wants to, to hear um, asked, and that's to you, Janet. Um, do you feel, I mean, the way you're speaking um, about, you know, being well-intentioned and then getting it done and finding partners and making it happen. Um, I find it to be a, a, an amazing skill set uh, when we you're in a position to develop that. And I wonder if you relate your ability to be this way, because um, you, you're, you're in the most senior role in the state of New York in what has always been a male dominated, I mean, always um, field. So do you think that, do you think that, you know, the, the diversity you bring to the table has uniquely enabled you to deal with the challenges of today? in a way that might not have been the case if you if you didn't have this diverse background? Diverse background in terms of my professional experience? I mean, well, I'm, I'm more, I'm, I'm even just the, the diversity in the sense of your gender. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well, in what has always been a male dominated. I, I'm gonna be, yeah, yeah. Well, w there was a very uh, highly regarded uh, chief judge before me named Judith Kay, who really was a, a terrific leader as well. But I have to tell you, I never think about my leadership style in terms of gender. Um, I think of my leadership style as very direct, strong, yes, and about accountability, you know, setting the mission educating our folks about the mission and then holding everyone accountable to do their part to achieve the mission. So I, 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 I guess some would say that that is muscular, maybe even some would say, and I don't know because I don't, I, I don't think in these terms, it's a male style of leadership. I don't even know what that means, but I have heard that said about me. I don't know what that means at any rate. I think I'm, I'm with you. you. I, 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 I just I wanted to hear you answer. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I'm thought of as a um, diverse female entrepreneur, minority female entrepreneur, and I just think I'm good at what I do. I don't think exactly. of myself in those terms. And um, I look at Kevin, and you're clearly um, a diverse in such an amazing way. And um, your diversity as you say, is um, not immediately perceived, but when you hear your actual story and who you are and the love in your life and everything else that you bring to the table, I just feel like, um, you know, I did um, an interview the other day with my, our developmental pediatrician, not to go totally off topic. And we were talking about the diversity in families today. And there's all kinds of families, you know, there's all, every, there's just, and it's, it's so exciting. My daughter's four and she's, there's so many things that's, you know, that's happening in our world. And he, I said, what do you think about all these parents that are coming to you from all diverse backgrounds? And he said, I love it because it's through the lens of their diversity as these children grow up in a very different environment that will enable them to think differently, to answer the, the problems um, 
that we've created for them um, and that and these complex challenges. So, um, you know, of course, it's like fun to celebrate diversity, but it's also really important to almost contextualize why it's important for for skills and leadership, even if we don't identify as being you know, exactly. diverse or as a woman or as a minority or, you know, um, somebody in the LBGT community who's uh, a leader in healthcare. Um, so I'm not sure where I was going with that. Um, but I, <laughs> I, do think, um, I, I do think that um, Kevin, you know, it, it, what's really amazing is to hear your background on how you develop leaders within your organization. And I'm wondering if um, maybe maybe for a moment we could talk about mentorship and how that works. Cause I, I think there are a lot of people listening in who are either leaders in their field, students, um, just people who want to be better and learn how to be better and need the fundamentals. Can we, I think mentorship is, is one of those. So, so I, you know, I, I spent most of my career mentoring, as I said, people of color and um, women. And you have to remember that as a nurse, my entire nursing career, I was raised by women leaders. So I had never worked for a man until I became senior associate vice president of Duke Hospital. And uh, my very first meeting with, I won't name who, but um, I thought, <laughs> well, this is different. Um, <laughs> but how, how so? How so? So uh, I'll tell you how so. It was interesting because there was uh, about 10 minutes of nonsense on the front end and about 15 minutes of nonsense on the back end and in between you would sandwich and you had this short period of time to get your points across and I was like uh no when I when I would go into all the nursing leaders I had had it was you knew they cared about you um because they would ask questions about how you were doing or and there was that but you got down to business and you got down to the accountability of performance that they were expecting from you. So that's what I had grown accustomed to. And so I learned from some incredible women leaders, but I also learned about this, the struggles and challenges they had of walking into a room that was all filled with men. And so it was from those learnings that I was able to take from uh, what I call um, these seasoned nursing leaders, the female leaders and help other female leaders start to think through how to act and how to feel and how to uh, uh, present themselves in a, uh, and, and not be caught up in their mind uh, uh, about, oh, I'm a woman and I'm the only woman in the room. Because if that's what you're focused on, you're, you're gonna struggle. Um, so how do you get people to feel comfortable in their own skin? And how do you help people find a voice? So, you know, I, I had a, a young African-American man that is now, vice president of heart services at a, a, a large uh, national organization. And he, um, when I was first mentoring him, he came to me and I said to him, I said, Brian, what's it like to be the only black male in an all white room? And at first he, you know, his eyes got big cause he's only 27 years old. And, and he said, how did you know I was feeling awkward? And I said, well, are you worried about being judged because you're a black man or are you worried about being judged because what you know and your competencies and skills? And he said, I'm worried about being judged by being a black man in a white room. And so what we worked on was how do you help someone like that find their voice? How do you help them think through how they're gonna position themselves in a room and make their first statement and not be caught up in, in the feelings of insecurity of, are they going to judge me as a black male? So once again, as a leader, you have to become very comfortable in having conversations around how race impacts people's development as a leader and how you can coach and mentor them in, 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 in advancing their careers and, and making them successful. Um, um, that's if, a, if I sorry. may for a second, so so Kevin's description of how he spoke to his colleague Brian 
uh, is really foundational in the way I think about mentoring. And mentoring is not an easy thing to do, and it's an enormous responsibility to take on. When you mentoring is about building an intimate, sustained relationship with someone. It's not about a twenty-minute conversation once every two weeks, checking in, hi, how you doing? It's about really connecting with a person and, and developing that intimate relationship so that you can ask the question, how, how, how do you feel as a black man with all these white people surrounding you? It, that takes a little bit of familiarity or a very confident inquisitor asking that question and an unafraid person to speak about those kinds of sensitive issues. And, and in every organization, I really do feel that mentoring is the responsibility of every single person at every level. You should be looking and seeking out um, the establishment of important mentoring relationships. Um. Well, I have been told that we only have 10 minutes left of this amazing conversation and it's time to turn it over questions. But uh, before we go there, I mean, this is so much fun. I feel like we could talk for a really long time and everyone has so, so much wisdom um, to, to learn from the, the two of you. Um, I, I would love for both of you to be my mentors. Um, <laughs> let's move on. Um, so we have time, I think, for two questions, three questions, uh, burning questions from the audience that we must address. Um, so forgive me if I jump right into it. The first question is actually for me. Um, okay, what's well, for me? So mm -hmm. I'll read it. Um, the US is in the throes of a conflict over the role of business and society. Business has the ability to make political contributions via Citizens United. And the current debate about voting rights and how business responds does not respond to this issue. So what is the role of business? What is its ethical and moral stance in regard to those, these difficult issues in society? Um, well, why do I have to get the hard question? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, my response to that is that Really and truly, the role of business in a capitalist society is to create value for its stakeholders. And I'm responsible to my investors, I'm responsible to my family who I basically work for um, to create value with, with the business that I've created. And I feel like if there is a market for the products that you offer in business, um, it's our, it's your role as a business leader to ensure you're listening, which we've discussed today, how important it is to listen, um, really listen to consumer insights and ensure that you're giving the consumer what they need and want and meet them in a place where they want to be met. And I think that that is the definition of a, su a successful kind of transaction, if you will, in business, um, if I'm boiling it down to those types of terms. And so m my feeling is that from a corporate leadership standpoint, we have to meet our consumers where, where they are and what they want from us. That doesn't mean that we can't develop um, develop a, a demand for something that they might not yet see. So 15 years ago, I started an organic, organic baby food business. And at the time we saw little frozen organic cubes of baby food. And I'm thinking this business is gonna change the whole world, you know? and it's again, it's frozen cubes of organic baby food. Um, and, you know, there were $6.99 at Whole Foods. And, and I would be asked that question, well, this is, you know, it's organic food for rich people. And I'm like, no, we need to show people that when you're a baby and you're developing, you, ha you have the right to have clean, non-pesticide, non-chemical ridden food grow the body that you then inherit and live for the rest of your life. And this is where it starts. And you know, fast forward 15 years later, um, Happy Family, I'm really proud to say, has lobbied state by state to be a provider in the WIC program. And before that, you couldn't qualify to use WIC dollars for organic food, it wasn't allowed. But now it is. And so it was a long road to get there. Um, but I do believe that it is the responsibility of business leaders to not only meet their consumers where they are now, 
so they can grow and be sustainable and profitable, but to be forward thinking um, about where their consumers will be in the future and how to then meet those needs. And I think that's that's a part of you know social responsibility when it comes to business that is what's exciting to me. It's why I'm in the game. I'm not here to sell things. I don't care about making money, honestly. I, I'm here to make change and I like to do it through business. So um, that is my answer. I hope it suffices. I will move on to the next one. Hopefully it's for one of you too. Uh, okay, it is for Janet. Janet, our next question is for you. Clearly, the judicial system of the USA has been as systemically biased against black and brown people and economically disadvantaged people. Acknowledgement of that is necessary to move forward. And as can be seen today in the trial in Minnesota, the judicial system will be tested every day and whether it is really being changed with regards to fairness and equality. What are practical and necessary changes needed to change policing and the judicial systems across the USA? And how do we go about making it happen, especially with the urgency that's needed for our country today? Mm -hmm. Well, I also agree. not an easy, not I an agree. easy question. <laughs> Certainly with the premise. I agree with the sense of urgency I have for years. <laughs> so me as the head of the uh, New York State justice system, there are many things that we are engaged in to promote equity in the criminal justice system, particularly, but also on the civil justice side as well. On the criminal justice uh, side, I run something called the Justice Task Force, where we study the uh, causes uh, uh, of wrongful convictions and uh, inequities in the criminal justice system, and we make recommendations for change. And we have been very successful there. Um, several years ago, before it was common practice uh, to uh, video record uh, custodial interrogations, we made those recommendations and we got the NYPD, our biggest police department in New York State, to adopt that as a practice. We recommended that um, um, uh, post uh, uh, defendants, uh, convicted defendants, have available to them testing for post conviction testing of DNA to uncover wrongful convictions. So uh, there are many, um, uh, we have created institutions that are studying and making recommendations for change and not recommendations that wind up sitting on a shelf. We make them, we do the hard work, we make the recommendations and we move them to practices. On the civil justice side, we have equally concerning issues. There are millions of people in New York State who go unrepresented on very foundational serious issues in their lives. And we have a, established a permanent commission on access to justice that studies these causes. We fought and received $100 million in funding every year for civil legal services that comes through and no other state uh, I believe no other state in the country uh, has been able to achieve this. We are, are uh, granted $100 million a year in the state's judiciary budget. And what we do with that money is we provide it to civil legal service providers so that people have access to justice services, so that lawyers are assigned to people to make certain that cases are being fairly presented on behalf of poor litigants, black and brown litigants, poor litigants, and making certain that we are um, achieving equity in our decision making. Well, thank you, Janet, for fighting mm -hmm. for fighting for us and for um, mm -hmm. for for making this happen. We have one last question, and this one is for Kevin. Um, okay, so. It's obvious that you have a very robust internal compass that drives you to make the world better, which comes across the digital divide here, um, not just to maximize monetary returns for your organization, um, but not everyone has this view of the world. And what do you think needs to change to ensure that even people who don't share your drive are still helping to create the kind of just world that you're striving for? Well, um... I can't tell whether my response is going because I'm old and bitter. Mm -hmm. or, um, 
but I've learned a valuable lesson. When I was younger, I worked towards trying to have conversations with people who were not like me uh, to consider differences um, and think about things differently. And I believe we're at a place in this country where we are so polarized um, that trying to have those conversations, you're probably not going to change a segment of the population's mind. So how do we collectively come together around our likenesses? Um, and how do we have meaningful conversations and begin to, to have conversations that are less threatening to begin so you develop a relationship and then through that relationship, begin to talk about our differences. But if you start at the difference point in where we are today, um, you're probably not going to make an, an impact um, because we are so polarized as a country. But we do have a lot in common that we can talk about. And so how do we, how do we find those common areas to begin to partner and through those partnerships evolve in our relationships so we can have the broader conversation? Um, but I, I watch uh, a, a lot of people who are trying to, to do it the other way. And I, I get that, that, that youth and that energy, but having done it for a long time now, I also realize the realities of how you transform and change the world. Um, and it's one person at a time. Uh, and uh, you're not going to change a whole group of people's thinking about something, but how do you begin to influence how they might think? Um, and, and taking that approach and strategy in my later years has been the most successful part of, of making change. Uh, well, thank you for that very perfect answer. And I think um, the themes today are finding common ground, having good intentions, finding partnerships, organizing, um, taking action, codifying, holding each other accountable, transparency. These are all, um, you know, these values that that I believe, at least if you can't, if the between the two of you, um, the individual leadership that you you showcase is is tr is truly transformational. Um, so I want to take a moment to thank you for this incredibly uh, special discussion, Janet, Kevin. Um, I think I think it was very inspiring um, for me, for sure, and I'm very honored to have had the opportunity. Um, so I believe all of us in the Columbia Business School community very much appreciate. I'm speaking for them as as if I'm allowed to, but I'm going to. I believe everyone <laughs> in the Columbia Business School community um, is very appreciative for you taking the time to be with us today, given everything that's going on. So thank you kindly and um, really um, kudos to to both of you for being such incredible leaders that we we should all emulate as well. Thank you, Shazi. You made this very easy and fluid and we appreciate that. Who knew? Um, I think there's some fun <laughs> to work here. And of course, I uh, want to offer a great big thanks to Dean Costas, Baglaris, and the Deming Center, um, the, the DEI Inclusion Initiative at Columbia Business School for putting the panel together. Um, there's, there's so much behind the scenes work to create this and to bring you to us today. And I believe that um, believe it was really special and worthwhile. So thank you very much. Stay very healthy and safe. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Shazi. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for doing it. Thank you.